So hello everyone and welcome to Spectral Geometry in the Clouds. Uh, today it's a pleasure to listen to Frédéric No from uh, Jussieu, who is going to talk to us about GOE and GUE statistics for random covers of hyperbolic surfaces. As usual, don't hesitate to ask questions during the talks. If you ask them in the chat, we will um, repeat them to the speaker in the microphone. Uh, Frederick, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to give a, a talk in this now uh, legendary uh, Zoom seminar. So I'm going to discuss uh, some, uh, some uh, things related to random matrix theory and, um, and Laplace uh, spectrum for uh, random families of uh, hyperbolic surfaces. So I'm going to start uh, with some old stuff, uh, which is uh, related to the field of uh, quantum chaos. And it, it all started in the 80s, uh, basically. So there is an old conjecture by physicists, uh, which says that um, uh, whenever you have um, a chaotic uh, classical system, then um, the quantum counterpart should be uh, the spectrum should behave, so it's a very loose statement, of course, hein? but the spectrum should behave like the spectrum of uh, random matrices of the classical, uh, classical ensembles of uh, random matrices. Uh, so there is an iconic picture from the 80s. So if you, uh, if, you, uh, if you haven't seen this picture, it means that you, you're quite young. Uh, if you have seen this picture, uh, it means you're quite old. <laughs> uh, this picture um, can be found in, in several papers, but I think uh, it was first, uh, well, I'm not so sure, but you, you can find this picture, for example, in the, in the introduction of the book of Meta uh, on uh, random matrices. And I think it was borrowed from some some earlier, earlier, earlier papers. And the, and the picture is as follows. So here are some, uh, some energy levels of uh, various systems. And uh, on the left, you have a completely uh, uncorrelated level. So it com it's completely random. Basically, your levels are independent random variables. So whenever you have an arrow in this picture, it means that you have some uh, very close uh, energy levels, very close eigenvalues. Okay. Of course, the prime, prime numbers, they, they look pretty random. And then C, C is an actual atomic experiment. It's, uh, it's called Erbium 166. Don't, don't ask me what it is. It's some uh, isotopic um, version of some uh, rare uh, Metal and they are doing some uh, neutron um, scattering experiment, and they do observe some um, some resonances. and And when you look at the energy level, it doesn't look as uh, as random as in the Poisson case. And then D is the Sinai billiards, so it looks even less random. Then you have zeros of the Riemann zeta function on the critical line, and then you have the lattice, which is completely, uh, completely rigid. Um, and, uh, and the philosophy of that is that uh, uh, you would like to, uh, to understand this, this rigidity as, as a marker of the classical chaos. And uh, indeed, uh, when you look at the random matrices, uh, you can actually prove uh, in a very, very uh, precise way what is uh, spectral rigidity. And this is what I'm going to discuss a little bit. And then we will move on to the, to, to the Laplace spectrum and see the connection. Um, so the, the, the first statement in this, uh, in this conjecture of uh, Boigas, Giannoni, Schmidt say that when you have uh, time reversal uh, quantum systems, then the, 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 stati the, the spectral statistics should be GO, okay? And when it's, when it's non-reversible, uh, for example, if you have some magnetic fields or stuff like that, uh, then it should follow GU, 
okay? So there is a difference. And then people, uh, mostly physicists, started to, uh, to study this question a little bit deeper, uh, mostly by using the, the Goodsviller semi-classical trace formula and playing around with it. And they gave some pretty good uh, heuristics on how you can actually show uh, uh, that you, you can recover a little bit of this um, uh, random matrix conjecture by looking at various spectral, uh, spectral quantities that I will, I will define later. Uh, so first, uh, Anne Osorio de Almeida and then Berry, they gave some, uh, some good heuristics and they highlighted the role of periodic orbits in, in this business. And there is this famous uh, diagonal approximation argument, which is at play in uh, all these papers. And the key point is, how do you justify this diagonal approximation? And then more recently, there was the other paper by Richter and Sieber, who basically showed that you, you cannot just uh, rely on the diagonal approximation argument if you want to to go further and, 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 and get more, uh, more explicit asymptotics, more detailed asymptotics, you have to take in account some of diagonal terms related to certain pair of um, periodic orbits. So the lesson from Richter and Sieber is that uh, diagonal approximation alone is not enough if you want to, to get stronger statement. And here in the picture, you have the spacing, nearest neighbor spacing level, nearest neighbor uh, density, uh, which is the, the GO case. And again, uh, it's, a, it's a version of, uh, of uh, a chaotic billiard by C9. Uh, so they, they did some, some numerics, I guess, at the time, and then plotted the result against uh, the predicted G, GOE. Uh, curve and this is what you get. And of course, it's very far from the Poisson, which is the, unco the uncorrelated case. So, so let me give some more, more detail about that. So there are several invariants, several uh, spectral quantities that you would like to, to compare with the, the model of random matrices. And uh, the simplest one, I'm going to define it, are the smooth uh, linear spectral statistics. So there are several variants of that, the form factor, the two correlation. But the simplest is probably the, the, the linear spectral statistics. So how does it work? So you start with some, uh, <coughs> some random uh, matrices. The Gaussian orthogonal ensemble is, is just uh, some uh, uh, self-adjoint matrices, which do verify some kind of invariance with respect to the orthogonal group. Hence the name. And if you want to be more explicit, you have to take uh, some Gaussian variables. So you take symmetric matrices, Gaussian variables, which are uh, uh, standard Gaussian variables on the diagonal. And then on the off diagonal, you have to change a little bit the variance. And in, in a similar way, using some uh, complex Gaussian, you can also define the, the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And then what you can prove, um, and this is actually the, the, the main result of this theory, that you can actually completely compute the joint probability uh, distribution for the eigenvalues. And it's given by this formula. So this is a density of probability for the eigenvalues. And there is a parameter beta. So, so Z beta is just a normalizing constant. Which is you, involving some, some gamma functions. And beta, so beta equal one gives you GOE, and beta equal two gives you GUE. Okay, so you see that the, this correlation factor between eigenvalues is getting stronger when you move from uh, GOE to GUE. So what about, uh, very simple uh, smooth uh, counting functions. Okay, so if you want to, to count uh, in a smooth way, you can just count uh, your eigenvalues uh, using a smooth uh, test function, psi, which is the Fourier transform of um, 
basically Fourier transform of a compactly supported smooth function. Okay. So your test function is in the Swartz class. And the expectation of this counting function, you can actually compute this. It grows like square root of n. Okay. This is because of uh, Wigner's law. The mean um, level spacing is uh, one over square root of n. So if you, can, if you do this computation, you, you get that term. And what is interesting is the variance. So you compute the variance of this guy. And you can actually compute it, compute it at the limit n goes to infinity, of course. And this is this, this formula. Okay. So here you see the influence of the beta factor. So beta one is GOE, beta two is GUE. And this is the only uh, effect of the, the switch from one, uh, one ensemble to the other that you can see on the variance. So let me mention that uh, uh, when you do this computation, um, you can find it, it's, it's in, in, in a remote uh, appendix in the, in the book of Meta. And I guess they, they published some paper at some point um, about that, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't really find the, the papers for some reason. You know. uh, but you, you get the computation and the detail in the book of Meta. Uh, you have to decipher it a little bit because it's written in the, in the, in the famous style of, of Meta, but, uh, but it's correct. And, uh, and, 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 and what is very important to notice is that this, this guy, doesn't capture a lot about uh, the, the correlation function. For example, it involves the two-point correlation function, but only a tiny bit of information about it. More precisely, you just need to know the, the behavior of the, of the Fourier transform of the two-point correlation function uh, near zero. This is, and this is where the two over beta comes from, OK? So if you want to capture more information and recover uh, the two-point correlation function, you have to rescale your counting function up to Heisenberg time. So you have to divide by the square root of, you have to multiply lambda j by square root of n here. And this is a completely different game, okay? And, uh, I will explain uh, why we are very far from being able to, to do that. We have to content with like a, that kind of counting instead. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, Laplace uh, Laplace spectrum with the simplest possible model of uh, compact hyperbolic surfaces. So I'm taking uh, a quotient of the hyperbolic space by a co-compact discrete group of isometries and. Uh, This is how it looks. So this is the fundamental domain here in white and the, the genus two surface on the right. When you take the quotient, so you have discrete Laplace spectrum. And I will, uh, I will write things as usual in the hyperbolic geometry that I will uh, write the eigenvalues, the actual eigenvalues as one quarter plus Rj square. And Rj is uh, either um, real or uh, imaginary. So imaginary is when you have uh, the so-called small eigenvalues, which are below one quarter. Okay, so you have a geodesic flow um, with countably many uh, periodic orbits. And uh, what is important to notice that uh, uh, you can decide uh, to orient your closed geodesics or not. And it makes, it makes a difference in the counting. And the famous uh, counting result of Huber is actually a result about uh, oriented closed geodesics. Okay. okay. So when you count here like that, um, uh, the set of primitive closed geodesics, they are oriented. Otherwise you have to, if they are not oriented, you have to divide this asymptotic by one half, okay. And this, this asymptotic is, is, is well known. Uh, it's been known for quite a long time. 
And there is something which is very interesting about it that it's it's uh, it does not depend really on the on the genus or the, the surface itself. The the remainder term will definitely depend on the surface. But the leading term is completely universal in some sense. And I guess this is what uh, led the physicists to their heuristics and led them to the computation with uh, the diagonal approximation. Uh, we will see how it works in the end if I have time. But basically, the universality will come from this simple asymptotic. So the original problem is a, a semi-classical problem, okay? It's a high energy problem. So the way physicists stated their conjecture is you take a counting function. So alpha is an energy level. L is some window size. And you would like to count this function. You would like to understand the asymptotics. Uh, and the spectral uh, statistics of this kind of functions, so variance, for example, uh, in the semi-classical regime, a priori. Okay, so if you do that, uh, the, the value is just this asymptotic. Uh, so N of L and alpha behaves like uh, something explicit. Um, and then you, in principle, physicists tell you, you should, you should look at the, at the variance of this guy still in this uh, high energy uh, regime. And you should observe something which is like uh, what you get when you compute the GOE or GUE model. Okay, and, and there are no results at all in the literature actually. Except, except, except a negative uh, result. When you look at the arithmetic groups, so when you have arithmetic groups, the variance will not look like the GOE uh, variance. It will, it will look more like a Poisson uh, thing. And it's because of the, of the high multiplicity in the, in the length spectrum. And this is completely rigorous. But apart from that, there were no results. But some numerical experiments by some physicists uh, show that if you use some kind of averaging over families of surfaces, then you, it looks better, at least at the numerical level. So it might be, it might be a good idea to average this counting function over some uh, families of uh, hyperbolic surfaces instead of looking at uh, one fixed uh, surface and letting alpha go to infinity. You can uh, change a little bit the game and uh, average over uh, larger and larger families of, of surfaces. But then there is a question if are you still looking at the semi-classical limit, high energy limit or not? So we will see. Very soon. There is a very recent result of, uh, of Rudnick, which says uh, the following thing. Uh, if you look at the moduli space of compact hyperbolic surfaces uh, with uh, genus G, so it's a, there is a finite measure on it. So that, that gives you a, probab a natural probability measure on this moduli space. And you can look at the variance defined this way. So you just uh, Average over families of uh, compact hyperbolic surfaces. And Rutnik result is the following. So you don't need to go to high energy. You can fix alpha, but you take a double limit. So first you average, then you take limit genius goes to infinity. And then there is this parameter L, this window size, and you let it go to infinity. And then you do recover the exact same formula from the, the GOM model. Okay, so it's not really uh, it's not really an answer to the to the conjecture. 
it's a different way to attack the problem and you, you get something which is really uh, exactly what the GOE is predicting. So, uh, so the proof is, is basically um, um, following uh, the intuition of physicists, but uh, using uh, uh, the power of the averaging effect. And basically what this uh, averaging is doing is that it is uh, justifying this diagonal approximation. And uh, at the core of the proof, uh, you need to use, the, the, of course, the integration formula by Nozakani, but, but even something uh, stronger, which can be found in the paper of Petri and Nozakani about the, the behavior of uh, simple closed geodesics. They behave that like, like independent random uh, variables. And this is really what you use this. This is really what you use here in the proof. <coughs> uh, and what I'm going to talk about is, is the discrete version of that. A discrete version of that, instead of uh, averaging over uh, the, the full uh, moduli space, I'm going to look at uh, Covers. So a way to, to look at covers, so, so we fix a base surface uh, X, okay, any any hyperbolic surface, and we look at all the covers uh, of degree N, so X tilde over X. And a way to parameterize, uh, a way to view th this uh, space of covers just to look at uh, homomorphism from the from gamma, the, from the fundamental group of the base surface, into the symmetry group Sn. Okay, so whenever you 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 have a homomorphism from gamma to Sn, you have an associated uh, cover. So if you want the cover to be to be connected, you need the, the, this homomorphism to act transitively on one N, if it doesn't act uh, transitively, you have uh, disconnected, uh, you have several connected components in your cover, but it's fine. It's not a real uh, technical problem. So let me mention that uh, when you when you have a surface group, you do have a relation, okay? So when you want to, to, to construct a homomorphism from gamma to SN, you have to satisfy the relation, okay? So you have uh, two G generators, and then you have to stratify the relation. So basically, when you compute uh, <coughs> the size of this uh, of this space, uh, the asymptotic behavior is uh, factorial n to the two G minus one. So basically, you lose uh, you lose one uh, because of the relation. Okay, you have two G generators, but you cannot pick them all independently because of the, of the relation. But this is the asymptotic size of uh, this space. Uh, of course, uh, it's not really a, it's not really a moduli space. It's more like a discrete technular space because in this space uh, you may have isometric surfaces. Okay, so in principle, what you should do is to quotient this guy by uh, by automorphism. Okay, to get really uh, non-isometric. Uh, representative, but at the technical level, if you do that, it's too complicated, okay? And, and, and since this is the, the finite space, there is indeed a probability measure on it, and we, we work with the, simply the uniform probability measure on this finite space, okay? Okay, so what, what is known is that uh, this cover is uh, with high probability, this cover is connected uh, when n goes to infinity. Okay, so, so there is just one guy here with high probability. And uh, most likely it's not a Galois cover. So what I'm going to do now is to, uh, to look at Laplacians on these uh, random covers. But I want to look at uh, twisted Laplacian because I want to see the effect of the uh, the time reversal symmetry on the on the spectral statistics. So a way to do that is to twist your Laplacian by uh, just a simple Abelian character. 
So we take an abelian character which is globally defined on gamma, okay? So it is, this Laplacian will be defined on all the, the random covers because they correspond to subgroups, okay? So you fix sky and you look at your twisted Laplacian on the cover. So basically it corresponds to the following eigenvalue problem uh, where you have this uh, uh, equivariant uh, boundary condition, I would say. So functions are not uh, gamma periodic, but they are gamma equivalent. And there is this sky coming out. Okay. Since this is a unitary character, okay, uh, you have this obvious relation. And we say that the character is time reversal preserving if uh, chi2 is equal to one. Okay. So intuitively, it, it, it corresponds to what happens when you look at uh, a closed geodesic. So it, it's, a conjugacy, it's a conjugacy class in the fundamental group. And if you look at the conjugacy class of gamma minus one, it's just the same closed geodesic, but with a reverse orientation. Okay. So this condition, if this condition is, is uh, violated, it means that for some closed geodesics, you can detect the, orienta the orientation via your character. Okay, your character is sensitive to the, to the orientation of, of closed physics. Any questions? No? I hope I'm, I'm not going too fast, but uh, just interrupt me if uh, something is not clear. So we are looking at exactly the same type of uh, uh, spectral object at the, as in, in the beginning and the result of Rodnik. We look at the variance of the twisted Laplacian on the end recover. And the result is the following. Uh, <clears throat> so it's again, you, you just look at the fixed energy level. You look at the limit of the variance when the degree of the cover is going to infinity, so the genus is basically uh, n times something. So it's, a, it's exactly the same type of, of, of limit at, as in the, in the result of Rudnik. And you do get the, the variance of the uh, GOE or uh, GUE depending on, uh, on the, the character, okay? So if your character, if chi2 is equal to one, you get GOE, and otherwise you get GUE. Okay, so you can see the effect of the, the time reversal symmetry on the spectral statistic as, uh, as uh, described or predicted by the, by the physicists. Uh, <coughs> You have to be a little bit careful here. So, so you may ask yourself, can you actually uh, let alpha go to infinity uh, uh, in some fashion, you know? Uh, so uh, as L goes to infinity, can you, can you let us alpha go to infinity? Uh, you can probably can, but alpha is going to be very, very small um, compared to L. Because, uh, because of Lou Sarnak, uh, there is definitely a regime that you cannot cross. So that's why there is a contradiction, okay? Because we know that uh, at, at high frequency, uh, the variance is uh, Poissonian. And if you start from an arithmetic surface, then all the covers will be arithmetic. Sorry, so- Can I just ask, uh, how, do you know anything about how fast this limit is in N or L? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, yes, there are some remainders, uh, but it's uh, it's uh, it's polynomial at best. Um, yeah, there are some remainders when you take the L limit. There, there are a bunch of remainders, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's I guess it's it's polynomial. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, the, the limit with respect to n, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's more tricky. Excuse me, Frédéric, you're saying that if you go to high frequency, at low frequency, you see this uh, GOE or GOE uh, yeah. statistics but, in, a yes. fixed, uh, in a fixed uh, energy interval, but if you go for the, same, for the same surface, if it's arithmetic, 
Then at high frequency, you will see, uh, even after averaging, you will see some, uh, some uh, poisson. We expect to see poisson. I mean, what I'm saying is that this result cannot hold at high frequency because uh, we do have some results. If you start with an arithmetic surface, all the random covers will, will be also arithmetic. Okay. And we know that for, the, for those guys at high energy, the variance is uh, Poissonian. So I think the effect, let the effect of the of regime, but, uh, it has to be slow, otherwise uh, something something weird is going to happen. Right, so you're averaging, you're averaging over the surface, over the cover. You know, the yes, cover. yes, so you're averaging, but uh, you're averaging over arithmetic surfaces, if your base surface is arithmetic. So I haven't checked what goes on when you alpha, when you let alpha move uh, with L, but my guess, and it's pretty clear in the computation, that uh, you can probably let alpha go to infinity, but it has to be very slow, like maybe some square root of log L, something. So L represents the width, the inverse width of the... Of the uh, yes. 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 No, no uh, Stefan, the, the width of... In, in, the, in the eigenvalue parameter, the, the, the width of the window is square root of the energy over L. Mm -hmm. No, no, but in, in, R, in R parameter, I mean, that's okay, the frequency parameter. The R parameter, then the, the width is one over L. One over L, yes, yes. Okay. But, but in, in that result, on the other hand, I guess that there are no real, so you will confirm, there are no real restrictions on alpha, no? You can let alpha go to infinity. Yes, but again, the order of limits as in your work is crucial here. You first take the large mm. volume limit as you do. And only then do you take the the, uh, the L to infinity, the, the, only then do you shrink the window. Yeah, yeah. It's crucial in, in both computation, that yeah. order of limits. The order is crucial for sure, but you could maybe here couple alpha and L? Yes, yes, it doesn't matter. Also, doesn't matter. I don't think it matters. No, in, in your work, it doesn't matter because my guess is that it's a continuous model, so you don't see, you don't see the arithmeticity somehow. If there is some. But in my, in my case, uh, when you look at the proof, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, you cannot take alpha uh, too much, too, 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 too big. So it works for fixed alpha, but my guess it's uh, you have to be careful. Could you also take L as a function of N, for example? So you have L equals N squared or something, you move, no? No, no, it will, uh, it will require, uh, it could be possible to do that, but uh, with a lot of work. This is what other people are, have been trying to do for a while. For a while, yeah, yeah. yeah concerning small eigenvalues. That is a much different issue. Yes, thank you. Sorry for interrupt. Okay. Um, I just want to mention some generalization uh, because I was interested to see, I wanted to see if uh, by looking at um, more general Laplacian, not, not just uh, abelian characters, but more general representation, there was uh, some kind of difference in the, in the business. And the answer is no. It's always GOE or GUE. So you can look at uh, uh, some uh, vector bundles over uh, Xn by, by fixing a unitary representation of gamma. And, uh, and the, so you have, you have a bunch of assumptions. You need to assume that uh, that your representation has a Zariski dense image in, in G, where G is your holonomy group, and G would be a, a compact uh, Lisa group of the unitary group. You do exactly the same thing, and, and the answer is, is very similar. So it depends on the trace uh, on the trace map. If the trace map is real values, it, Real valued is GOE, and otherwise it's it's uh, GUE. Okay, so you can check with your favorite uh, classical uh, 
contact Lee groups and, and, uh, and this is what you get. Um, <clears throat> okay, any questions? Okay, so now I would like to describe a little bit uh, the ingredients of the proof. Uh, the first step is to uh, relate everything to the base surface. So th the idea is to, to, to see the spectrum of uh, the twisted Laplacian on the covers as a twisted, uh, a double twisted Laplacian on the base. Okay. So you have your, uh, your twist row and you have another twist, which is encoding the, the cover. So it's very simple. Whenever you have your random homomorphism, you, you do have a unitary representation going from gamma to uh, unitary maps of L2 of 1n, simply by acting by composition. It's a permutation matrices. I n of gamma is just a permutation matrix. And a fact which is called uh, the induction formula in representation theory essentially uh, tells you that the, the spectrum of uh, delta rho on the cover is just the spectrum of uh, twisted Laplacian on the base. And the representation is just a tensor product of this representation and the other one, okay? So you do have a character formula. And what comes out in the character formula, of course, you do have the character of, um, of Rao. And the other character is just the number of fixed points of, of your uh, permutation. So the number of fixed points uh, uh, will play a critical role in this, uh, in this business because they, they show up in the trace formula. And, uh, and you need to understand very carefully uh, how these uh, random variables, I should say, uh, behave when n goes to infinity. Okay, so these guys are basically uh, um, the analog of the simple uh, closed geodesic in the in the in the moduli in the moduli space uh, model. Uh, so let let me give you some uh, some overview of what's known on, on this subject. Uh, ah, first I should say okay. So um, the main tool, uh, which is uh, justifying uh, what I said uh, before, is just the trace formula, uh, the twisted version of the trace formula. So it's just like the regular trace formula, except that you, you do have uh, these characters in front of this uh, geometric sums or they're close to this X. When you are computing averages, you clearly need to understand the expectation of these guys. Okay, so the averages over all covers of degree N. And this is the key, uh, the key part of the proof. I mean, the key input. Okay, so. Just for the record, here is, here is the formula. I won't use it uh, later on. So I can just skip it. I can just skip that one. Uh, and in the end, I will recall you if, uh, if you want what you need to know. Okay, so the, mo the most important part uh, is, is really here. The, the most important input is here. And it's, it's an analog of uh, the result of uh, you know, Zakadi Petri for the, the Bale Peterson model. So Fn of, of, of gamma is number of fixed point of phi n of gamma, which is a permutation, a, a permutation or a random permutation. I mean, not so random, but uh, we like to understand how it behaves. No? And the first result is that uh, when n goes to infinity, when you compute the expectation of the number of fixed points, it's the number of, di of divisors of k plus an error term of uh, size of, of big O of one over n. And you can have several other uh, uh, terms actually. 
So what I should say that all these results uh, for surface groups are due to uh, Doron Puder and Michael Maggie. And then there is a further paper by uh, Maggie and Zimron. Uh, that alone requires a, a bit of work. Huh? It was known uh, for, for three groups uh, for quite a long time. And then for uh, surface group, it's, it's much more recent. In particular, when gamma is primitive, so k is equal to one, okay, so gamma is a primitive world, it's not a power of, um, a non-trivial power of, of, of gamma. D of k is equal to one, okay, so the, the expectation of the number of fixed points is one plus something that goes to zero, and one, is exactly the expectation of the number of fixed points of a random permutation if you pick it uniformly. So primitive worlds, primitive worlds give you some uh, permutation that behave like a truly uh, uniformly distributed uh, permutation. And then there are some correlation results which are very important in, in this business that when you take two different words, so by two different, it's also very important, they, they don't belong to the same cyclic group. Okay, so you, gamma must be different from gamma, gamma, gamma one must be different from gamma two and, and the inverse. Then the random variables given by the number of fixed points are asymptotically uh, mixing, I would say, or decorrelated. And, uh, uh, you get an error term which is of the same polynomial size. Okay. And then you can also compute some other type of correlation of uh, uh, when you have different powers. Uh, and it's given by some, uh, some weird uh, arithmetic function. Uh, but uh, the most important part is here. And this is what is going to perform the diagonal approximation, essentially. This kind of uh, decorrelation will, will kill, basically, uh, the multiplicity uh, phenomena that you, you do have uh, when you have arithmetic groups. OK, any questions? No? So let me show you how it works. Um, uh, yes? Uh, for two, what happens when you have more than uh, two random elements? Uh, what do you mean two random elements? Um, so like if you take gamma one to gamma k, do you know that their fn's are independent? Pairwise it's true, but what about the joint distribution? Ah, you mean the, the no, no, so, uh, so uh, yes, I mean, uh, there are stronger results. You mean uh, really independence of, uh, you mean really independence of random variables, not just the uh, decorrelation. That's your question? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. So if you if you look at the paper of uh, of Puder and Zimoni in the proof, they, they show more than that actually. And they show that uh, these uh, random variables are actually asymptotically really independent. It's stronger than that. Yeah. So you cannot also compute some higher moments. I mean, there, there is much more than that in the in here. Uh, okay, so let me give some ideas of the proof. Um, So we fix the energy level once for all, okay? So it's not really a semi-classical computation. It's a large N computation. So the expectation of the counting function is very easy to see. Uh, you do have an asymptotics, it grows like N times some constant. So this is your probabilistic value. And, uh, and then you, you look at the variance, so you remove that term. And if you use the trace formula, what you get essentially is uh, the square of a sum over, um, <coughs> over class geodesics. Um, so you have to rewrite it uh, using uh, non-oriented primitive uh, class geodesics. It's, it's much better to look uh, at the sum that way. And so when you took 
when you take all the expectation and you take the limit n goes to infinity because of the decorrelation, you are basically killing all the off diagonal terms except some, uh, some near diagonal term, I would say, which contributes essentially to log of L over L square. Okay, so it, there is some kind of arithmetic sum here. And this is, uh, this is clearly uh, not too big. Uh, and the leading term is really here. And, and, and here at this level, it completely, it's completely diagonal now. So of course, L is fixed. You compute Vn, you let N go to infinity, you recover some diagonal thing. And now you are going to take L goes to infinity. And what do you have now on the diagonal? You have that kind of sum. So basically th th that kind of uh, asymptotics were more or less work out, worked out by, by, by physicists. If you look at the, the paper of Berry, I guess he's doing something like that. Uh, the key thing is here is uh, the presence of characters which will change uh, the, the, the asymptotic in the end. Uh, essentially, if your character, if chi square is, uh, so I'm doing the proof uh, in the simplest case uh, where you have abelian characters. Okay? So if chi square is equal to one, then this guy is just, is just four, it's a constant. You just need to use the prime orbit theorem and uh, do some uh, summation by parts and uh, take some limits. And you can compute the basically the asymptotic of uh, this diagonal contribution, which is really a square over four times this uh, this integral that we have seen in the GOE computation. And thus, in the end, you recover the, the variance of the GOE model. And when uh, chi square is not equal to one, uh, so you do have some cancellation here. Okay, you have some cancellation. So you have two plus a sum over uh, you know, chi square, um, which is here. And essentially, this guy is, is much, much, much smaller than the, the, prime, the prime orbit theorem. Okay. So this is quite easy to show. It's because when you twist your Laplacian, when the twist is non-trivial, the bottom of the spectrum is no longer zero. It is shifted slightly to the right. And this allows you using a trace formula, for example, to show that this, these subs are actually uh, smaller. So this guy is not actually contributing to the limit. And there is just this two here. Okay. And, and, and so you just one, one half of the, of the GUE computation is the GUE computation. So one half of the sum is getting canceled, and this is how you get a GUE in the end. And uh, I'm probably done here. So that leaves us a little bit of time for more questions if you want. But uh, this is the outline. So what you see from here is that uh, you recover definitely something related to uh, GUE and GUE, but it's very, very, uh, very small information about the, the correlation function, for example. It's just uh, essentially the one moment of the two correlation function. If you want to, to prove something stronger, you need to rescale your, uh, your test function. And uh, if you rescale your test function, if you want to observe some macroscopic uh, uh, thing about the two correlation, you need to go all the way up to uh, Eisen Eisenberg time which means in this trace formula business, you end up with something which is uh, completely um, out of control. I mean, it's, it's impossible to do that. Uh, so if you go to RM first time, it's not enough. So RM first time here would be log of N. And this is not going to give you anything more than what I did here. But we already know that from uh, the paper of physicists, you need to catch you need to catch some off diagonal terms to get more uh, more precise asymptotics. 
So I guess the lesson is that uh, it's going to be quite difficult to, to improve the result just by, uh, by ways of, uh, of trace formulas. You need something different. So this is basically, I gave the answer to, um, to this first question. So I guess you, you can rewrite the paper and say something about form factors or something like that uh, in the fashion of a physicist paper. So basically you can recover the first asymptotic term of the form factor and that's all. If you want the other term, it's, you, you clearly need orthogonal terms and I don't know how to do that. And then there, there is this question, uh, can, you, can you get GSC statistics? Because there are some, uh, so people ask me that question. So I don't know, I tried some uh, variant of that, but I don't, see, uh, I don't see how they could pop up here. So maybe you look at, maybe you need to look at Laplace on automorphic forms because the, the trace formula is quite different, but I, I don't know, I'm not too sure. I have seen that they made a call in the Dirac operator. Yeah. The Laplacian. Whether or not the Dirac operator is tractable by these methods, I, I don't know. But uh, people from uh, Steiner School have, have looked at this. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Roman, if he's still conscious, uh, conscious will, will remember this, or Stefan. Some of the older people. Uh, and then one one last comment is uh, it might be possible to prove something like that for the viable uh, negative curvature case for the reason that the, the, the fundamental group is, is the same, the combinatorics are the same. The only thing that you don't have an exact trace formula. So you need something like a, a good Hadamard parametrics, but uh, as you see, we are not really going very far here. We are not going, uh, we are, it's not really a semi-classical uh, computation. So maybe it's possible to do something uh, with a, a good enough uh, uh, parametric for the wave equation. So maybe it's possible to replicate the result in, in the variable negative curvature phase. I don't know, but. I have the feeling that it's not so far. The parametrix is valid uh, at high frequency. I mean, when it's not exact. Yeah, it's not exact. A good Villard trace formula is valid at high frequency uh, in the semi-classical regime. I mean. yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 here you, since you are, you know you are taking the variance, you are somehow subtracting the error term in the in the in the Hadamard parametrix or in the trace formula. So you don't really need to know much, much, much about uh, the R term. So maybe there is something that is doable. Okay, so I'm done. Uh, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Stefan, for the uh, Frederick for the for the talk. Uh, yeah, we have time for uh, questions now. On top of those uh, that came up during uh, during the talk, correlation comes from this uh, this. Uh, Fixed points of uh, random permutations, right? I mean, this is really. Uh, so when you compute your variance, you have your double sum, as you guess. You compute the expectation, and you have guys like that. And uh, so when you subtract the, so when you compute the variance, you are actually subtracting the contribution from the base. So you you don't have exactly those guys, but more or less those guys. So you have here the. The, when you are doing the per, computing the the world sum, uh, you get a product of things that are going to zero <clears throat> for the off-diagonal terms. So they are basically killed when you take the the large n limit. And the remainder one over n here, you, do you have to control uh, to control it with respect to the length of gamma one gamma two? Or no, just... because no, because we fix l first. And uh, you take the large n limit, and then we take the large L limit after. But you could do it uh, up to log time, I guess, but it would not improve the result in the end. No, but it gives you, if you take L to be uh, logarithmic in some sense. You can remove the limit, maybe. You can, re you can remove the limit mm -hmm. by taking L of uh, the size of log n. Thanks. Uh... 
one for a question. Do we have other questions for uh, Frédéric? Uh, so I find it uh, very cool that uh, uh, depending on the character and whether it has time reversal invariance, you get uh, these two behaviors. Can you quantify to what extent? Uh, um, so it seems to manifest in this exponential, in this sum decaying uh, at an exponential rate, which is smaller, like you were explaining. Uh, can you quantify a bit the spectral gap in terms of the uh, representation you pick? And can you tell which representations will be a bit less good? Uh, I don't you, know if it's very clear. You mean this result here? Uh, yes. Yes. So for abelian characters, you do have some quite precise uh, results. Actually, it's it's in a, it's it's uh, it's it goes back to counting function in in homology counting uh, closure physics in homology classes, and there were at the time a bunch of papers by uh, by Sunada and then Philip Sarnak, uh, and and the key uh, part of this uh, game is to show that this is a non-generate quadratic form with respect to the character, so it has a critical point. But it is non-degenerate. So when k is close to uh, the trivial representation, of course, it is close to zero. But you can quantify uh, the distance of uh, uh, lambda naught with respect to uh, to zero in terms of the, some distance to the trivial representation. So there are some quite, uh, I would say, uh, quantitative uh, estimates for lambda lambda naught. Cool, thank you very much. Thanks about uh, Laura for the question. Do we have any other for uh, for Frédéric? Hey, what type of characters do you, can you have uh, which are which have k square is equal to one? So k is equal to plus or minus one. I mean, what, what do they? Yes, uh, plus minus one essentially. <laughs> yes, but what, what, so what does it mean? I mean, what type of uh, I mean, how can you interpret these these characters in terms of because the, the the abelian characters, you can interpret them as a magnetic field, you know, a magnetic yeah, potential. Yeah. What does it mean then that chi square is equal to one? That somehow usually adjust, you adjust the uh, magnetic potential so that uh, it, when you turn around any orbit, you, you get uh, the integral of the potential is a half integer or something like this? Uh, that's a good question. I think these are spin covers. I think is yeah. related to that. In covers? Spin. Spin. Um, uh, there's something in Riemann surface theory that, that such characters. Yeah, but, but so spin covers are more related to characters of the unit tangent bundle of the surface. So when you have, uh, for example, Laplacian on automorphic form, then you need to choose some, uh, some spin cover. Here is, is really a character of the fundamental group. But uh, yes, right. But the kernel is of index two, so it gives you a double cover. Yes, yes, sure. So it may it's something yeah, related. To that. I mean, you can definitely yeah. manufacture plenty of them, I mean, but the physical meaning, I don't know. Really. I mean, the characters they are they are, they are this, the choice of characters is it, is it discrete or are they continuous? These characters. I mean, can they, in a sense that right. continuous space? It's a uh... new space. Okay. Yes, okay. Essentially, some torus. So does it does it does it amount to putting a, a run of bone threads in in each uh, handle in some way? Or, so it does not change exactly. the, the, the geodesic. So it like it's like putting a run of bone. Uh, exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. A run of bone flux. Okay, and so here it means that every run of bone is uh, gives you a. A flux of one or one half in some sense, you know, or maybe you multiple of uh, integer or half integer, maybe this, this, uh, I mean, fixing the characters to be, to be uh, real, <coughs> or to be, to be, to be, uh, to be uh, not real, but inimportant. It <coughs> means that you have to fix really the, the, the flux, the, the arm of bomb fluxes to be, uh, yes, integers or half integers, maybe. Okay. Thank you. Do we have other, uh, comments or questions for uh, the speaker? I think what would be very nice uh, to do is to tie to uh, do this G G U E business in the Vey-Peterson model. Yes, but yeah, so 
but the, uh, I guess you need to define uh, you, you need to define what is a twisted Laplacian here. Yeah. It's not as easy mm -hmm. in, in this business. No, the Laplacian is this twisted Laplacian that you, you have on each Riemann surface. You just need to be able to average. Yes. Uh, the question is, do you average as well? Uh, characters, these characters. So you need an analog of Mirzakhani's um, integration yeah. formula in this setting. That's all you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So th there are some, uh, some versions of that. I mean, uh, no, but the only thing which changes is not is not uh, the average over the surface. What changes is just uh, uh, the ensemble. There is no average of a chi here. You don't average over no, chi. No, no, no. Chi is fixed. You need to. This is a discrete model here. So you just can fix chi, which is a representation of gamma, and then it works on all uh, covers. But the question is on the moduli space. Uh, there is no can canonical chi that, that is defined on a, on a, not for all surfaces. So you need also to probably to, to look at the, I would say the moduli space of um, complex line bundles over in surfaces or fixed genus and extend the Mirzakani theory for, for this guy. Yeah, sure. exactly. You need the, the, the space of flat, integration of formula. flat vector bundles over, um, over Riemann surface. Riemann, so the base surface is also, is also moving. So it's, uh, so the bigger moduli space of um, which one just look at complex line bundles, flat complex line bundles over um, surface. So it must be somewhere in the literature, I guess. But, but, but do they have some kind of Mirzakani formula? I don't Thanks uh, okay. the, for the comment. Um, I think uh, we can. Uh, 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 so here we will have uh, we will we will reconvene next week as usual with um, a talk by uh, Maria Del Mar Gonzalez uh, next week. The title will be um, circulated as the week goes on. I think we can thank Frederick again for uh, the great talk and uh, uh, that seemed to inspire a lot of. Uh,